Welcome to the Russian Rulers History Podcast, Episode 79, Stalin's Great Purges, Part 1. Last time, we followed Joseph Stalin's initial phase of purges of the old Bolshevik party, eliminating many of his opponents. The stage is now set for an even greater level of carnage, one that would threaten the viability of the USSR. On November 8, 1932, Nadia Alelueva was attending a get-together with her husband, Joseph Stalin, Molotov, and others when an argument broke out. Nadia and Joseph had a stormy but loving relationship, which was well known in the upper echelon of Soviet society. Nadia headed back to her apartment, followed soon thereafter by her husband. He fell asleep as usual in his room, his room, passed out after a hard night of drinking. The cause of her death was a gunshot wound to the chest. Stalin claims not to have heard the shot, which can be understood due to his heavy drinking. Some have int intimated that Stalin shot her himself, but from everything I've read, that's highly unlikely. Also, he took her suicide very hard. He knew her since she was a preteen, falling deeply in love with her before the revolution. Her death caused another departure from caring about human suffering, which was to cause undue pain for tens of millions of people. Molotov said about the death, quote, The cause of Aleluyeva's death was, of course, jealousy. There was a large gathering in Voroshilov's apartment. Stalin rolled some bread into a ball and threw, threw it at Yegorov's wife, with everyone watching. I saw it, and this seems to have had something to do with what happened. Kirya Aleluyeva Polokoskovaya wrote, quote, Mama told me later that when Nadia got home, she must have thought it all out in advance, because she bolted her door. And nobody heard the shot. It was a little revolver, a lady's. They say she left a letter, but nobody read it. The letter was for him, Stalin. No doubt. He poured her heart out in it. We have a first-hand account from Svetlana, Stalin and Nadia's daughter, who defected to the United States in 1967 and wrote a tell-all book on her notorious father. In the book, she recounts a story told her by her nanny about the day her mother died. Quote, My father usually slept in his study or in a little room with a telephone next to the dining room. He slept there that night, arriving home late from the anniversary banquet, which Mama had left earlier. These rooms were a long way from the servants' quarters. To get there, you had to go along a little corridor past out our bedrooms. Father's room was on the left, mother's on the right. She was found dead in the morning by the housekeeper, Carolina Till, who had bought her breakfast. She suddenly rushed into the nursery, trembling all over, and called the nurse. Mother was lying by the bed, covered with blood, with a little Walther pistol given to her by Pavlusha in her hand. They rushed to the telephone and called Avilia Inkudze, the chief bodyguard, and Molotov's wife, Polina, who was Mama's close friend. Molotov and Voroshilov arrived. But even with these first-hand accounts, there are still questions about Stalin's complicity with her death. He was known to have physically abused his wife. There's an account from the future premiere and podcast topic, Nikita Khrushchev, of a time when Stalin dragged his wife Nadia by the hair onto a dance floor, kicking and screaming. At the funeral, Molotov had this to say about the boss, quote, I had never seen Stalin weeping before, but as he stood there, by the coffin, tears ran down his cheeks. She loved Stalin very much. That is a fact. He did not push the coffin. He went up to it and said, I didn't take, care, take enough care of you. What is curious is the way Stalin handled himself at the funeral procession. He walked with the procession for about ten minutes until he approached a series of apartments when he got into a car to avoid a possible assassination attempt. He knew how many people wanted him dead, and he took precautions to avoid potential 
mishaps. He would continue this paranoia, rightfully or not, for the rest of his life. At this time in Soviet history, we find the last time any internal threat to Stalin's rule can be found. It revolved around a dashing and popular Bolshevik leader, Sergei Kirov. Sergei Moronovich Kirov was the leader of the Azerbaijani Communist Party from 1921 to 1926 and the head of the Leningrad branch from 1926 until his assassination on December 1, 1934. I will fully cover this charismatic man in a future podcast, so I'm going to cover the Kirov murder now as it was the nexus point for the great purge of the late 1930s. Kirov was a very loyal supporter of Stalin through the 1920s, which is why he was given such an important position as the party leader of Leningrad, once known as St. Petersburg, or Petrograd. Dashing and good-looking, as opposed to the pockmarked Stalin, many of the old Bolsheviks felt he was their last hope to unseat Stalin and revert back to classic Leninism, Marxism. In 1933, Kirov made his stand when he opposed Stalin's demand to execute Mardamayan Ryukin because of a 200-page repudiation of Stalin and his policies. Stalin, angered by the opposition, tried to isolate and push around Kirov, but his popularity kept growing. Ben Legzinoviev, Kamenev, and Ordhanokinzi flocked to him so Stalin knew he had to get rid of him lest he would be abandoned and murdered by all his enemies. But just getting rid of Kirov was not going to be easy as he had a strong power base. In Stalin's twisted mind, he thought he could use this man's death to his advantage. And he gave the job of staging an assassination of his rival to the secret police NKVD commissar, Genrik Yagoda. Yagoda eventually found the perfect dupe to carry out the murder, one Leonid Nikolaev. On the day of the assassination, the bodyguards around Kirov were shuffled around, but not enough to arouse suspicion. On December 1, 1934, with only four police bodyguards nearby, Nikolaev went up to the third floor of the building Kirov worked at and lay waiting for his victim to come out. He shot Kirov in the back of the neck, a known execution method used by the NKVD. Quickly, all those associated with Nikolaev and the assassin himself were liquidated. His entire family were either summarily executed or sent to labor camps to die. There is no doubt as to Stalin's involvement, as the book, The Cure of Assassination, puts it, quote, One thing is certain. The only man who profited by the Kirov assassination was Stalin. Seeing how profitable it was making Lenin the state saint, Stalin seized on the opportunity to vilify the Trotsky, Zinoviev, Kamenev, Ryutin Kadri, blaming them for the assassination of the Bolshevik saint, Kirov. To honor Stalin's fallen friend, four Russian cities were renamed in his honor. Kirovokrad, Kirovakan, Kirovabad, and Kirov. Numerous old Bolsheviks were implicated in the killing, mainly because of moral complicity, a made-up charge used often by Stalin's, especially when there was no real hard evidence to the person's guilt. Stalin's rewriting of history would have you believe that Kirov was not a threat, but a column of support for his regime. But in, the 1930, but in 1934, at the annual Soviet Congress, Kirov received only three negative votes, while Stalin got 292. 292 fatal choices. Kirov obviously had to go, but his usefulness would far outlast his 48 years of life. Someone had to create this fictional land where the rightists, led by the treacherous Trotsky, sought to undermine the socialist Eden comrade Stalin was so eager to create. Except, there was no equal socialist state. The communist leaders led extravagant li lifestyles, living in dashas, once occupied by the Romanovs and their supporters. But now, the state, 
ruled by Stalin, controlled everything, and if you displeased the boss, nothing you had was really yours, including your life. Now, this is a very important concept to understand, as it was the basis of Soviet life until its fall in 1991. I'm going to repeat that. Nothing you had was really yours. It was all the states, and that included your life. Even though Stalin now had a reason to destroy the entire old Bolshevik network, the question you have to ask is, why? Well, you need go no further than Lenin's writings to find out why. He once was quoted as saying, according to Trotsky, quote, Lenin often ridiculed so-called old Bolsheviks and said that at 50, revolutionaries should be sent to join their forefathers. This grim makes a serious point. At some critical stage, every generation of revolutionaries becomes a hindrance to the further development of the idea which they have carried forward. And, as Lenin was also quoted as saying, quote, You can't make a revolution in white gloves. Yagoda was now ordered to focus on the Trotsky Zinoviites as the enemies of the state. But Stalin noticed a little weakness in him, a hesitance. He turned secretly to Nikolai Yezhov to look over Yagoda's shoulder, so to say. Yagoda was a servant of the party run by Stalin. Yezhov was a servant of Stalin alone. Molotov saw what was going on and wrote, in his autobiography many years later, quote, Until 1937, we lived the whole time with opposition. After that, there were no more opposition groups. Stalin took the whole difficult business upon himself, but we helped. Stalin wanted 1937 to be a continuation of the revolution in a complicated international situation. It was a time where international events were becoming clear to Stalin, especially the growing threat of the Nazi party and their charismatic leader, Adolf Hitler. Stalin could ill afford to have opposition in his country. He needed complete control to battle what he saw as the coming war with Germany. So in the newspapers, after Kirov's murder, the masses were whipped into a frenzy blaming the, blaming the Zinoviites as the killers of the communist Saint Kirov. Seven days after the assassination, supporters of Zinoviev and Kamenev were arrested. Fifteen days later, the two supposed conspiratorial leaders were arrested as well. Yagoda was unable to convince the men to confess to their crimes, but Stalin was. In January 1935, both had confessed to complicity to a greater scheme to undermine the grand communist plan for the people, for personal gain. Many were now sentenced to prison, but that was not all that was asked of them. Yezhov was building up secret files of alleged conspiracies, while Yagoda was clumsily fabricating evidence against hundreds of old Bolsheviks. Then an ominous law was passed in April of 1935. In it, it stated children 12 and older were to pay the same penalties as their parents, including death. Hundreds of thousands of innocent children would perish because of crimes supposedly committed by their parents. Tens of thousands of old Bolsheviks were now imprisoned in 1936. But that was not enough for Stalin. Now he wanted to prove to the rest of the world that traitors existed throughout the USSR, whose intent was to wreck the socialist Leninist Kirovian dream. A secret conference was held to inform the NKVD members of a conspiracy to overthrow the USSR, led by Trotsky, Kamenev, and Zinoviev, funded and supported by the West, especially Hitler, Great Britain, and the United States of America. Zinoviev and Kamenev were tre treated in ways meant to break their spirits, so they would do anything to spare their lives and end the inhumane torture. The beloved writer Maxim Gorky was loud in his support of Kamenev, so much so that he quickly died of, um, 
natural causes. On August 19, 1936, the trial of the assassins of Sergei Kirov began. The Trotskyist leftists were summarily found guilty, but not before they implicated the Bukharan-led rightists. Kamenev was executed silently. Bidzinoviev was half-crazed while being dragged to his execution chamber, begging that they call his friend Stalin to spare his life. When Stalin heard of the pleas of his old friend, it is said that he laughed. Alexei Ryutin, the man who started the whole affair that Stalin used to rid himself of potential rivals, wouldn't testify in court publicly like Kamenev and Zinoviev would. His old buddies would plead guilty to a fault, begging forgiveness for daring to doubt the boss's undeniable quest for a socialist utopia. Ryutin alone was a man of conviction. Nonetheless, he too was shot. Shot to death on January 13, 1937. Yagoda confidently was the builder of evidence of the leftist conspiracy when he was given the job of building two canals, and one was the Moscow-Volga Canal. He used the slave, slave labor of Stalin's enemies to build the needed waterway. Except that this promotion was a common ploy of Stalin, right before his plan to liquidate you. Yezhov was promote, also promoted to run the secret police within the NKVD, eliminating the GPU. Yezhov increased the salaries of all his new underlings and made them more powerful. Everyone was now targets of NKVD scrutiny, even the boss, Comrade Stalin. Now, conspirators were being arrested every day. Pyatikov and Radik were trapped in prison and made to see their conspiratorial ways. Soon, more old Leninists were ensnared and made to confess that the exiled Trotsky was still trying to take down Stalin and prevent the Eden of Socialism from taking place. Stalin was the producer of a play of conspiracy that was to enthrall the Russian people, yet stupefy the rest of the world. The brilliance of what Stalin had done was to find fault of others for the suffering of the people, so when he, the boss, the little father, the Batushka, gave them bread, meat, milk. They loved, worshipped, idolized, and fought for him. The Tsar, the Romanovs, and the Rurik line before them had nurtured the figure of the little father who loved his people and would do so much more if his evil ministers would just be removed so the path to the all-loving ruler could be clearer. Oh, how the people were deceived. It was not an easy deception but one that was carried out with brilliance by Stalin. I'm going to tell a little personal story here. I was a young boy in 1970. I went to East Berlin with my father to visit some cousins. When we got there, we were obviously being followed by two secret police officers, as one of my cousins was a nuclear physicist, who strangely enough just couldn't make it to dinner that night. While we whittled away some time until we could meet his wife and daughter for dinner at a swank, well, if you could call it that, East German restaurant. My father and I walked the streets, noting the still very apparent bullet holes in the walls of most buildings, remnants of the Russian invasion of Berlin in 1945, when we came upon a line of people that was wrapped around a corner. When my father asked them what they were in line for, a woman said, well, she didn't really know what it was they were you know, about to buy, but she was sure that her family needed it, and she was happy that she was going to get it, whatever it was, thanks to the government. When we got to the front of the line to see what they were so happy to buy, we saw that it was toilet paper. Another thing I vividly remember was looking into the windows of a number of stores, and whatever was there on the display had a small little sign underneath that said, Verkauft. My dad explained to me that the word verkauft meant sold. Basically, he told me it was all a scam. The people had nothing but a dream of their benevolent government providing for them. Except that their government kept blaming us Americans as capitalists for denying them the ability to buy these goods. 
As a young boy of twelve, I understood that the East German government was lying to their people. Stalin taught his people well. Join me next time when the Great Purge reaches a fever pitch with millions being sent to their death in preparation for the Great Confrontation with the next evil threat to Russia, Hitler's Nazi Germany. This week's person of focus is Maxim Gorky. Alexei Maximovich Peshkov, better known to the world as Maxim Gorky, was a Russian author, political activist, and one-time favorite of Joseph Stalin. Born in Nizhny Novgorod on March 28, 1868, he was orphaned at the age of nine. At the age of 12, he ran away from the orphanage he was placed into and found his way to his grandmother, who raised him. But when she died soon thereafter, he greatly despaired. He began to travel across Russia for the next five years, taking notes and getting the feel for his country. He worked as a journalist for a number of newspapers. His writing began to reflect the lives of the Russian people, especially the lower class of people, the peasants. Gorky's writings turned political, following a Marxist, social democratic leaning. He spoke out fervently against the Tsarist regime, causing him to be arrested a number of times. Gorky was elected to be named as an honorary academician of literature, but Nicholas II ordered the award annulled. Because of this, both Anton Chekhov and Vladimir Korolenko left the academy. Over the years, he became friends with a diverse group of people, like Chekhov, Leo Tolstoy, and in 1902, Vladimir Lenin. He became a friend of the Bolsheviks, going so far as to head to the United States to raise funds for the party, which he never became a member of. In 1906, Gorky headed to the island of Capri to escape the pressure of being a revolutionary writer during the conservative backlash after the 1905 revolution. Living there for seven years, he continued to write both fictional works and social commentaries. Then, in 1913, to celebrate the 300th anniversary of the Romanov dynasty, he was pardoned and allowed to return to Russia. He continued to be a leading writer on the plight of the common man and criticized the continued repression throughout Russia. Gorky continued his relationship with Lenin and the Bolsheviks, but had a falling out with them after the revolution when his newspaper, Novaya Zhin, fell under the censorship of the Bolsheviks in response to the Russian Civil War. His work, Untimely Thoughts, was highly critical of the repression of the communists. He accused Lenin of being just like another Tsar. Gorky left Russia to head to the Italian town of Sorrento due to his coming down with tuberculosis. Years later, Stalin invited him back to Russia. He visited a number of times before returning for good in the early 1930s. Stalin used Gorky to help write positive articles about the USSR. But by 1934, he began to become disillusioned with the government, especially in response to the growing repression imposed by Stalin after Kirov, the Kirov assassination. In 1934, his son, Maxim Peshkov, died suddenly and under suspicious circumstances. This embittered Gorky, and when Lev Kamenev was arrested, he personally and publicly called for his release. This angered Stalin, and there was circumstantial evidence that the boss ordered his murder, which was carried out by agents of the NKVD under Genrik Yagoda. But according to the government report at the time, Maxim Gorky died of natural causes on June 18, 1936, at the age of 68. Two of his pallbearers at his funeral were Stalin and Molotov. Well, I hope you liked today's podcast. Fortunately, I'm going to have to take a two-week break. Uh, I'm going to miss one you know, next weekend because I'm putting on a uh, health conference in Bellevue, Washington for the weekend. And just I'm going to be a little too busy to get things uh, finished up in time. I am working on the second part of the Great Purges. And I tell you, it is a very difficult one to uh, go through because the suffering of the people in Russia during this time was immense. 
and uh, does take a little bit of doing to get through it. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, please visit the website at russianrulers.podhoster.com or our Facebook fan page, which is growing every week at Russian Rulers History Podcast. You just asked to join. And there you can ask a question, make a suggestion, or leave a comment. Now, as always, до свидания и спасибо большое.